Scripture reading we'll read this evening before uh, our lesson will be Genesis chapter 15, verses 4 through 6. Genesis 15, 4 through 6. And behold, the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, This shall not be thine heir, but he that shall come forth out of thine own bowels shall be thine heir. And he brought him forth abroad and said, Look now toward heaven and tell the stars, if thou be able to number them. And he said unto him, So shall thy seed be. And he believed in the Lord, and he counted it to him for righteousness. Well, it's good to see everybody here again tonight. Hope you have had a good day. And uh, I'd, it's like we're doing something wrong with all this hail coming here. I don't know what the deal is, but some of you told me tonight you didn't get any. Maybe you're doing something right. It's been interesting the last few weeks with all this weird weather we've had around here, but I'm glad that you are here and hope you have your Bibles with you. Go ahead and be opening your Bibles to Gen uh, Acts 27. We're going to come back to Genesis in just a minute. Acts chapter 27. Last Sunday morning when Brother Gilpin was here, he preached from Acts 27 in the morning. And last year, the end of last year, the last quarter or semester, I guess, I taught an online course uh, on the book of Acts. And earlier that year, earlier last year, I taught through the book of Acts on my daily live stream. And, you know, I don't know how many times I've read the book of Acts throughout my life, I guess. And, you know, that's one of the benefits sometimes of listening to somebody different, or in my case, listening to somebody instead of being the one always speaking. You hear things or perhaps you see something in the text as you're sitting there and someone else is reading that it's not that I've never seen it before. It's just it hit me differently, you might say. And that's in Acts chapter 27, this phrase in verse 25, I believe God. Now, that's a very simple phrase, very simple statement, but it carries a lot with it. And that's what I want us to study tonight. So I'm not going to cover the entire chapter of Acts 27, just a few verses we'll look at first. And of course, this is Paul as a prisoner on his way to Rome. And let's just start, I'll just start reading in verse 21, Acts 27, beginning in verse 21. But after long abstinence, Paul stood forth in the midst of them and said, Sirs, ye should have listened to me or hearkened unto me and not have loosed from Crete and to have gained this harm and loss. You know, they've, they've lightened the ship in every possible way because they were afraid of it uh, going down. And now I exhort you to be of good cheer, for there shall be no loss of any man's life among you, but of the ship. For there stood by me this night the angel of God, whose I am and whom I serve, saying, Fear not, Paul, thou must be brought before Caesar, and lo, God hath given thee all them that sail with thee. In other words, he's going to preserve the life of everybody that's with you on the boat. Now, it's interesting. We'll just stop right there for a second. If you turn back just a couple of pages to Acts chapter 23. Uh, this is not long after Paul has been arrested in Jerusalem. And he is given an opportunity to speak for himself. And one of the things that he, uh, that we read here in Acts chapter 23 is in verse 11. It says, the night following the Lord stood by him and said, Be of good cheer, Paul, for as thou hast testified of me in Jerusalem, so must thou bear witness also at me, uh, also at Rome. Now, these, that statement in Acts 23, 11 is not necessarily connected with the events of Acts 27, but it's the same, you know, the same overall thought, that he's going to get to Rome one way or another. It's not going to be like his first three missionary journeys where he goes with, uh, of his own free will with various traveling companions. He's going to go to Rome as a prisoner. But his life is assured of him all the way back there in Acts 23. So anyway, back to Acts chapter 27, uh, verse 24. Fear not, Paul, for thou must be brought before Caesar, and lo, God hath given thee all them that are still with thee, or that sail with thee. Wherefore, sirs, be of good cheer, for I believe God, that it shall be even as it was told me. Howbeit we must be cast upon a certain island. So they're going to have a shipwreck, and we understand the ship broke apart. They all survived. And uh, Paul ultimately makes it to Rome. So I, I want to think about that idea for just a few minutes. We'll look at a couple of biblical examples of 
this very idea brought out in other texts, and then we'll make some practical application of this idea of I believe God. And like I said, those are that's such a simple phrase, but there's so much to it that we can apply for ourselves. And this is also the case. There's a difference in saying I believe in God and I believe God. There are a lot of people who believe in God who do not believe God. And I think as we go through this uh, material tonight, you're going to see exactly what we're talking about. It's very possible for somebody to believe in God, that there is a God, that He exists, and at the same time not believe God. So here's what I want us to do. Let's take our Bibles first to Genesis chapter 15. Genesis chapter 15, we're going all the way back to the life of Abram, what uh, Forrest read to us just a few minutes ago. And this, this actual phrase here that we find in Genesis 15, 6, he believed in the Lord and it was counted to him for righteousness. That phrase is repeated about Abraham multiple times in the New Testament. Uh, Paul does it in Romans. Uh, he does it in Galatians. The book of James does it. So we have these repeated references to this event. But let's start reading. Forrest read verses 1. Uh, what did you read? 4 through 6. Let's start reading in verse 1 here. After these things, the word of the Lord came unto Abram in a vision, saying, Fear not. Abram, I am thy shield and thy exceeding great reward. And Abram said, Lord God, what wilt thou give me, seeing I go childless? And the steward of my house is Eliezer of Damascus. And Abram said, Behold, to me thou hast given no seed. Now, contextually, going back to... We're introduced to Abraham, or Abram, in Gen the end of Genesis chapter 11. We're given the lineage, who he's related to, who his father is and all of that stuff, where they're from. And that's really it. We learn that he's married. His wife cannot have children. And then you open up to Genesis chapter 12. You know, if you're a person, let's say, who's never read the Bible before, and you just start reading in Genesis chapter 1, and you, you read all the way to Genesis chapter 11, and you pick out, okay, so there's this guy named Abram. He's married to Sarai. She can't have children. And then you open to Genesis 12, and it's God making these promises to Abram. Um, Get away from your father's house. Go to a land that I will show you. I'm going to make your descendants as the stars of the heaven. And through your seed or through your descendants, all nations of the earth are going to be blessed. And the thing is, when that promise is made, Abraham is set, Abram is 75 years old and his wife cannot have children. She's barren, as the biblical text says. So we read a few more pages to Genesis chapter 15, let's say, again, never having read the Bible. Well, why did God choose Abram? Where does this guy come from? What's the significance of all of this? And, well, you have to keep reading through the book of Genesis, and then you read the rest of the Bible, and you figure all of that out. But, thou hast given no seed to me, verse 3. I don't have any descendants. I've got this servant over here. Why don't we just let him do it? Be the heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, This, talking about Eliezer, shall not be thine heir. But he that shall come forth out of thine own bowels shall be thine heir. See, the thing is, God had already made the promise. We don't know precisely at this point in time how much time had passed. Now, you, you keep reading the account and you get to chapter 16. Ten years has passed because now Abram's 70, uh, 85. The promise was made at age 75. We know what he and Sarai work out with Hagar. They have Ishmael. That's not the son of promise. And yet the promise is reiterated in various texts. You go down to, uh, for instance, Genesis chapter 17, verse 1. Abram was 99 years old, so now 24 years have passed since the promise was made. Sarai is still barren. They still have no children. And then you look at Genesis 17 too. I will make my covenant between me and thee and will multiply thee exceedingly. I don't have any kids. How is that going to happen? Genesis 18, the promise is reiterated and so on. We get then finally to Genesis 21. And the Lord visited Sarah as he had said, and the Lord did unto Sarah as he had spoken. For Sarah conceived and bare Abraham a son in his old age. And this phrase is so important here in Genesis 21 and verse 2. At the set time of which God had spoken to him. We're not given all those details right there of that phrase about the set time. We're just told repeatedly 
before we get to, from Genesis 12 to, to 21 here, you're going to have children. And it's going to be through Sarah. It's not going to be through Eliezer. And it's not going to be Ishmael through Hagar. It happened at the set time of which God had spoken to him. And Abraham, Abraham called the name of his son that was born unto him, whom Sarah bore to him. Notice the emphasis there. That's the promise. Isaac. And Abraham circumcised his son Isaac, being eight days old, as God had commanded him. So you look at Genesis 15, 6. And Abraham believed God, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. That is reiterated. Let's go, in fact, and look at this to James chapter 2. Like I said, Paul deals with this in Romans 4. Paul deals with it in Galatians. I believe it's in Galatians chapter 3, uh, where Paul talks about the uh, seed. But let's go to James chapter 2 and look at this account. And what, again, remember what we're trying to do here. We're trying to figure out what does it mean to believe God. We know what it means to believe in God, but this is something quite different. So James 2, and we'll just start in verse 21. Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he had offered Isaac his son upon the altar? Seest thou how faith wrought with his works, and by works was faith made perfect? And the scripture was fulfilled, which saith, Abraham believed God. There's our phrase. And it was imputed unto him for righteousness, and he was called the friend of God. Ye see then how that by works a man is justified, and not by faith only. So there's example number one. What does it mean to believe God? God spoke to Abraham. God fulfilled that promise. But along the way, from those promises of Genesis 12 to the fulfillment of that promise ultimately in Abraham, uh, in Isaac, in Genesis 21, Abraham faithfully followed God along the way, didn't he? Now, he wasn't perfect. You have, in, for instance, in Genesis 12 and also in Genesis 20, where Abraham lies about his wife. You have in Genesis 16, where Abraham and Sarah try to step in and take care of God's business for him. It's not that he was sinlessly perfect, but he was a faithful and obedient follower of God from the time he was called until the time the promise was fulfilled, and obviously even beyond that. And then you have this phrase here in Genesis, or rather James chapter 2 and verse 23, and he was called the friend of God. So let's look at our second example real quick. Turn over to Deuteronomy chapter 9. The book of Deuteronomy is essentially Moses' uh, farewell address, let's say. And he reviews, he reviews Israel's history from the very beginning up until the present point in time. And we'll just read this one verse. I, I, we don't obviously have time to examine all the context, but we're going to connect it to another passage. This is talking about their approach to the promised land and what God has told them to do once they get to the promised land. Deuteronomy 9.23, Likewise, when the Lord sent you from Kadesh Barnea, saying, Go up and possess the land which I have given you, then ye rebelled against the commandment of the Lord your God, and ye believed him not. So this is the flip side. Abraham believed God. Well, what does that mean? He, he listened to God and he did what God said do. Well, Israel believed him not, nor hearken to his voice. Ye have been rebellious against the Lord from the day that I knew you. Moses speaking. So let's do this. What he's talking about here when he sent them out from Kadesh Barnea. Take your Bibles to Numbers 23. This is the event he's talking about. Numbers chapter 13. And we're not, again, we're not going to try to read every verse here. But this is when the 12 spies are sent out to... Check out the promised land. They come back with their report. So let's just start here. Numbers 13, look beginning in verse 17. Moses sent them unto, uh, rather Moses sent them to spy out the land of Canaan and said unto them, get ye up from this way southward and go into the mountain and see the land, what it is. And the people that dwelleth therein, whether they be strong or weak, few or many, and what the land is that they dwell in, whether it be good or bad. And what cities they be that dwell in, that they dwell in, whether in tents or in strongholds. And what the land is, whether it be fat or lean, whether there is wood therein and not, or not. And be ye of good courage and bring of the fruit of the land. Now the time was the time of the first ripe grapes. Skip down to verse 23. See, he sends them out. They go do their job. Verse 23, they came unto the brook of Eskol and cut down from thence a branch with one cluster of grapes. And they bear it between two upon a staff and they brought of the pom uh, pomegranates and of the figs 
The place was called the Brook of Eskol because of the cluster of grapes which the children of Israel cut down from thence. Uh, verse 24, and they returned from searching of the land after 40 days. We could read all the way down to verse 29. They get back to Aaron, verse 26, and Moses. They bring back word. Um, verse 27, we came into the land whither thou sentest us. And, it's ex and I've made this point before. Everything is exactly like God said it would be. It's a land that flows with milk and honey. There are houses that you're not going to have to build, that you're going to live in. There are vineyards planted that you didn't plant that you'll harvest. I mean, it's all ready for you. It's just like God told us, verse 27. But then look at verse 28. Nevertheless, the people be strong that dwell in the land, and the cities are walled and very great. And moreover, we saw the children of Anak there. The Amalekites dwell in the land of the south, and the Hittites and the Jebusites, the Amorites, all of these people, the land is exactly what we were told it would be. And, and you guys know just as well as I do that throughout, up until this point of time, God has told them repeatedly, go to the land and possess it. I've given it to you. I'll fight your battles. Everything is as God said it was. Of course, this is when Caleb speaks up. Let's go up at once. We are well able, able to overcome them. Verse 31 but the men that went up with him, the other ten, you know, Joshua and Caleb were the only two that were faithful. The, the men that went up with him said, we are not able to go up against the people, for they are stronger than we. And they brought up an evil report of the land which they searched unto the children of Israel, saying, the land through which we have gone to search it is a land that eateth up the inhabitants thereof. And, and it's gonna eat, they're going to eat us alive if we go in there. That's what he's saying. We're familiar with that phrase. And all the people that we saw in it are men of great stature. We saw the giants, the sons of Anak, which come from the giants. And we were in our own sight as grasshoppers. And so we were in their sight. All that to say from Deuteronomy 9.23, they believed him not. Now again, everything they saw was just as God said it would be. You go on into chapter 14, and of course, that's when they're sentenced to one year for every day they spent in spying out the land. That's why they spent 40 years wandering in the wilderness. But the point is this. We know what it means to not believe God, don't we? They didn't do what God said do. And they, they came back and they, as you read on into chapter, well, you look at chapter 14, verse 1 here. All the congregation lifted up their voice and cried, and the people wept that night. You know... We have so many things written to us in the Bible, and I suppose we'll talk about that in just a minute, that we can talk about as a congregation, that perhaps an eldership can plan and works that we can get involved in. And all it takes is one person to say, you know, that's not realistic. We can't do that. And, you know, you name it, whatever it may be, uh, a program of work or something. We, or how about this one? We've tried that before and it didn't work. There are so many ways that the work of the church can be defeated by one person being, well, let's just say faithless because they don't believe. They really don't believe what God's told them, just like the children of Israel. So we have that in Numbers chapters 13 and 14. Let's look at our third example and then we'll move on. Turn your Bibles to the book of Jonah. The book of Jonah. We're very familiar with this account, I would say. This is Jonah's, finally, his compliance with God. He goes to the city of Nineveh. He preaches what God told him to preach. Yet, 40 days and Nineveh shall be destroyed. And we know the response, don't we? You get there to Jonah chapter 3 and verse 5. So the people of Nineveh, look, believed God. Now, these people, we know these people were polytheists. They believed in many, God, uh, many gods. But when Jonah got there, they believed God. But it wasn't God that was speaking, was it? It was this man, Jonah, walking through their city and saying, Yet forty days and Nineveh shall be destroyed. Now, obviously, we're not told everything that was said and everything that occurred. The point still stands. Nineveh believed God. Well, what does that mean? They proclaimed a fast. They put on sackcloth from the greatest of them even to the least of them. For the word, uh, for the word came unto the king of Nineveh. And he arose from his throne, and he laid his robe from him, and covered himself with sackcloth, and sat in ashes. And he caused it to be proclaimed. It became a, like a royal decree. Repent. 
the people of Nineveh believed God. And here's their, um, here's their justification for that. Verse 9. Who can tell if God will turn and repent? And that, that would better be translated as relent, change his mind, and turn away from his fierce anger that we perish not. And God saw their works. So one thing that we can pick out from all of these examples, whether the two positive or the one middle, the one in the middle there, the negative one, what it means to believe God is do what he says. That's really what it comes down to. Abraham, uh, the Ninevites here, or Israel not believing God. That's exactly what it means. So to believe God is to trust what he has said and to do what he said. That's what it comes down to. And when you look there, again, going back to Acts chapter 27, Paul's on this ship. They've done everything possible they can do. And if you remember, one of the things that was, that was pointed out last Sunday morning was, Paul, as Luke's writing this, Luke said, all hope was lost. They had no hope. But Paul received this vision and his, his, his statement was simple. I believe God. Now we're going to run aground, but not one life is going to be lost. You do what God says do and how God says do it. To believe God is to trust what he has said and to obey his commandments. If you want a good definition of the word faith, it's right there. What does it mean to have faith? It means you take God at his word and you do what he says do. That's it. Now, you know, that's, that's not that hard. So I got to thinking about that. Well, okay, so what's the practical application of that? And there are so many, I guess there are so many directions you could go. I didn't put them up here, but I wrote a few down here. Just think with me for a minute. From, start from the very beginning. What does it mean for any person in general to believe God? Well, it could be in terms of salvation, okay? What, what has God said a person must do in order to be saved? I'm actually in the process of working on some material for when you read through the New Testament, everything that we are told that saves us. <coughs> right now I'm on like number 24. There's at least 24 things in the New Testament that we are told saves us. <clears throat> but we know that a lot of people would, would have us believe, well, <clears throat> all you have to do is believe in Jesus as the Son of God. That's it. Well, that would contradict at least 23 other things, wouldn't it? If there are at least 24 things that we are told to do in order to be saved, if you say there's only one thing, then you've got a problem with these other 23. To believe God, we need, if we're going to be saved, we need to believe God. Take Him at His word and, and do what He says. <clears throat> well, what about the salvation of others? All right, take your Bibles to Luke chapter 8 real quick. Let's think about this one. Is there... Let me think for a second. Is there, um, is there somebody maybe that you know that you've thought about that you think that person can never be saved? You know, like kind of like, I'm not going to waste my time. One of the things that the parable of the sower teaches us is that obviously there's, there's one seed, and the seed is the Word of God. Um, look at Luke chapter 8 and verse 11. <clears throat> the parable is this, the seed is the Word of God. <clears throat> but another thing that it tells us is that there are a variety of hearts in the world, and not all of them are receptive to the gospel. In a sense, and understand what I mean by this, that's not my business. What I mean by that is this, it's not my business to try to look at everybody and come up with a preconception about whether or not they're going to obey the gospel. That's not my job. That's not your job. We are not the judges. What is our job? Our job is to scatter the seed, right? Our job is to teach people. That's what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 1 and verse 17 when there's, <clears throat> there's that division in the church at Corinth. You know, well, Paul baptized me and Apollos me and Peter baptized. They've got this Contention in the church, and Paul says in 1 Corinthians 1 17, uh, the Lord didn't send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel. Now, we understand what he's, he's not arguing against the necessity of baptism there. He's saying, My job is to preach the gospel. Our job is to scatter the seed. Our job is not to decide within ourselves, well, so and so is not worthy of the gospel. They'd never obey it in the first place. How do you know that? And especially, how do we know that if we've never sown the seed 
on that soil in the first place. So you look at Luke chapter 8 and verse 15. <clears throat> but that on the good ground are they which in an honest and good heart, having heard the word, keep it and bring forth fruit with repentance. But if you retain the seed because you've determined they won't obey it, you'll never know if they have a good and honest heart or not. You never know. So our own salvation, what about the salvation of others? Do we believe God? That it's the gospel that's the power to salvation? And that some people have good and honest hearts? What about, um, what about this idea? Because I've heard this so many times over the years about God being so hard to please. And if you remember from the parable of the, uh, <clears throat> the parable of the talents, remember what the one talent man said? I knew that you were hard. You're difficult. You expect a lot. You, um, uh, essentially, he's saying you're unjust. And the master's response is, is well, if you, perhaps if you thought that, you should have worked a little harder than done nothing. There are those who believe, and sometimes even Christians, that it's not possible to please God and get to heaven. And I talked about that a bit this morning, um, about what we can know. We can know what it takes to please God. I think of Hebrews 11 and verse 6, without faith it is impossible to please Him. Well, again, what is faith? You take God at His word and you do what He says. If you don't have that, it's impossible to please God. For he that cometh to God must believe that He is, and then listen to this, and that He is a rewarder of those who diligently seek Him. Seek Him implies you're doing something. You take God at His word and you do what He says. That's the person that gets rewarded. All right? So... We can do that. What about overcoming temptation? James chapter 4 and verse 7. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Do we believe that? Do we believe God in, in, the, in the idea that we don't have to sin? We don't have to give in to temptation every time it comes our way. What about 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 4? I'm, we're covering some, I understand these are kind of some big umbrellas you might say. But I'm going to get more specific here in just a minute. <clears throat> 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 4 tells me that I can become a partaker of the divine nature. Well, what does that mean? I take that to mean as I read that text and the, the verses around it, I can become more like God. He's the divine nature. And as I increase my knowledge and I grow spiritually, I can become more like God. Do we believe that? Well, a lot of folks don't believe it, you know. And you guys may have had this discussion with people before. Um... I know I've had a, a lot over the years of they, they believe that humans, that we are inherently defiled. We have a sinful nature and there's nothing we can do about that. They're Calvinistic. Um, that's not what God says. You've got to go somewhere else to find that teaching. You're not going to find it in Scripture. Do we believe God that we are not like that? So then, you know, you, again, you, you get down to more um, individualistic. I, and just as I was thinking, I was thinking of various things. Do we believe God in terms of marriage? You know, that's, a, that's, a, that's part of the culture war that's going on right now. Pick your gender. Anybody can get married. Um, dealing, dealing with situations in marriage. Divorce. Remarriage. There are so many topics under that one topic. Uh, rearing children. Uh, parental responsibilities to children, children's responsibility to parents. Do we believe God? That is, do we take what he says and follow his commandments? Do we believe God? Um, and, and again, in, in terms of personal application, you go in passages like Ephesians chapter 5 where it talks about the husband-wife relationship. You turn to Ephesians 6, it talks about the uh, parents to the children and then the children to the parents. And then it gets even down to your... Uh, your work responsibilities. If you are hired by somebody, if you're an employee, do your job and do it as if you were doing it to the Lord himself. And if you've hired somebody, you pay them what's just and you do what's right. Do we believe God in all these realms? He's spoken to us in all these realms. And of course, a lot more. We could, I mean, we could even break this down to congregationally, the organization of a local church. Who's, who's the leader of the local congregation? Well, it's not the preacher. It's not me. It's the, it's the local eldership that has been, by the way, appointed by the Holy Spirit. That's what Acts 20 and verse 28 says, isn't it? The Holy Spirit has laid out the parameters of the eldership. And so he appoints the elders in that sense. And what about deacons and, 
and elders and deacons' wives, and the preacher. Now, a preacher doesn't have to be married, but most of the time he is. But you can go so far with this concept of, do we believe God? That is, do we know what His Word says? Do we trust what God has said? And that He will do what He has said? And then do we obey what He's commanded us to do? So you go back to the life of Abraham, Abram. He's got, not only does he not have children, Sarah's not able to have children. And that's why Hagar is introduced into the picture. But God made a promise. And when you look there at Genesis 15, 6, and you see it in Romans 4, and you see it in Galatians 3, and you see it in James 2, it's reiterated time and time again. Abraham believed God, and it was accounted unto him for righteousness. God, essentially, it's kind of the concept of you put it on his credit. God counted him as righteous because he believed God. He took God at his word and did what God said. Now think about this. So we read from James chapter 2, and we'll kind of wind down here. Uh, we read from James chapter 2 that he became the friend of God, that he was justified by his works. Remember that? Abraham was justified by works and not by faith only. Did Abraham and Sarah have to be involved to produce a child? Or did they just, yes, God said it, I'll have a child? It's not how that process works, is it? And we know that. They had to act based on what God said. And it's no different for us today. That you, that, and that's the thing. The God that Abraham and Sarah served is the same God that you and I serve today. And to believe God is not to believe in God. It's more than that. But to believe God today is exactly what it meant for Abram to believe God. And for him to be counted righteous in the eyes of God. And the same can be true of us. Do you believe God? I'm not asking if you believe does he exist. That's not the issue. Do you take him at his word and do you do what he says? If we do that, remember what James 2 and verse 23 says of Abraham? He was called the friend of God. That's what we want. It may be the case that you are here tonight and you believe in God, but maybe you need to be baptized and up to this point you've not believed God. You've not taken him at his word and you've not done what he said. It's very easy to see the gospel plan of salvation throughout the pages of the New Testament. If you're here tonight, let's say you believe in Jesus, that's great. It's where it starts. If you need to repent of your sins, you've got to do that too. You've got to turn away from sin and you need to be baptized into Christ for the remission of those sins. You cannot have your sins remitted before you're baptized. It's not possible. Do you believe God? Maybe you're here tonight as a child of God, having done that in the past, but you've not remained faithful. Do you believe God? We're told that if we confess our sins, 1 John 1, 9, He is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Do you believe God? If you need to respond to the gospel in either one of those ways tonight, let's do it right now as we stand and sing.